Hi and welcome everyone to the AIXC broadcast. Uh, this is one of our very first Ask Me Anything sessions and uh, I am Anisha, the editor of AI Executive Council, an initiative by the math company and super excited to host this AMA session for all of you. We are waiting for all of you to join in. We have a very special session for you today and uh, we're looking forward to a lot many questions coming up from all of you. So, uh, it, you know, without further ado, I'd, I'd just like to go ahead and uh, introduce the topic and our very special speaker for today. So the topic for the day is how to win at marketing strategies, how to make it stick and you know how we can use data to be a more of a data driven marketer that's that's what is our focus today and for that we have uh, you know a, a very special guest today and uh, i will take just a minute for that reveal so uh, the special guest today for the AIXC AMA session is none other than Ash Elbikai. He is uh, the AI Executive Council member. He's the Chief Marketing and Customer Officer, uh, the Customer Experience Officer for the Aspen Group. And as you can see, uh, he has uh, so many hats that he wears, and uh, he, 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 you know, he wears them all equally well. And uh, it's it's amazing to have Ash on today with us in this session. And looking forward to talk to him and learn a lot more about marketing, about his career, and. And uh, hoping that all of you will share your questions as well and get to learn a lot more today. So uh, a big, big welcome to you, Ash. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you, Anisha. I appreciate the nice, uh, the nice intro. Right, Ash. Uh, we, we have a lot of people joining in today, and and they range from uh, people who are just starting off in the industry, uh, or you know, uh, most of us uh, also uh, big fans of yours from the math company joining in. We have council members, your peers joining in as well, uh, and uh, we are looking at you know uh, discussing a little bit about how the marketing landscape has changed. So I would love uh, to start off with a little bit of you know uh, your background, if you can share with us your journey to the current role that you hold at yeah. the Aspen Group. Yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, we all take uh, unique journeys to find you know, ourselves where we are. And uh, I guess mine is mine is original and unique, but uh, probably, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of many journeys. And so I started my career actually as a psychologist trying to understand people's behavior. Uh, I then, you know, went into, um, a, you know, some areas of consumer insights, trying to understand consumer behavior. Then I went to management consulting, trying to understand companies' behaviors. And then, you know, putting all that together, um, I thought the best way to, to sort of bring all this together was actually a career in marketing. Because for me, marketing, it's all rooted in trying to understand the customer, but then it has to be translated. How do you take that and create business value and create great brands? And so I was looking for something that brought together all these things, the science part, the, the creative part, rooted in insights, the technology, all that coming together in a way uh, that I could sort of create value. And, and, and marketing over the years has uh, more and more gone from being just a function in an organization to really being the driver uh, and the soul of many companies because everything more and more starts with the customer, understanding the customer, and then creating business value around that. And so that's that's sort of how my career has progressed. And the reason you know I'm at I'm at Tag uh, is because for me, Tag is very unique. It, it's they, it, it believes in building great brands within the healthcare space. So you know everything we do, it's trying. It's you know, how do you change lives? How do you help people get better access to healthcare through building great brands that consumers love and trust? So it's actually a, a very ambitious goal. But to me, it brings together everything I care about: helping people, changing their lives. Um, rooted in understanding the customers and the providers, and then building a great value proposition and brand around that. So that's how I, you know, that's why, I, why I'm here now. Right. Thank you for that, Ash. And uh, this, this is just, you know, a part of your journey uh, in terms of uh, the next query that I have for you. The next question is around campaigns. So every marketer has run several campaigns and I'm sure you have, you know, you have looked at several successful marketing campaigns. So uh, what do you uh, use as, you know, a metric to uh, decide that, yes, this is a successful uh, marketing campaign? Yeah. And I'll go beyond the campaign, just say, how do you know what you're doing in marketing is being successful? Because right. I think campaign is too narrow. But 
So look, at the end of the day, and I know this is this is not super original, but everything to me anchors in the structure of, of the funnel, the, the customer funnel. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why, because you know, we all know as marketers that the funnel, you start at the top with just bringing consumers in and then how you keep them loyal. But the reality is the funnel forces you to really understand not just the metrics of what's happening, but it has it, it forces you to ask why. And uh, why is everyone, why are consumers sticking with you? Why are they not? And it forces you as well to bring in the customer experience in it because it's not just about the metrics in terms of is my you know my demand my conversion you know my purchase all you know everybody has different funnels in terms of what they're looking at but it forces you to try to understand you know what's happening here why is it working why is it not working is it rooted in my customer experience is it rooted in my creative is it rooted in you know it's not easy there's friction so it, it, it makes you really sort of dig deeper in terms of understanding that why. The other thing you know, we're realizing as we look at the funnels, the funnel is not just a series of different gates. It's sort of a, we call it like a, a living organism in my organization. It's everything is highly interconnected. And if you're not careful, and I've made this mistake, you know, you, you, you sit there, you have teams focused on certain parts of the funnel to try to unlock it. Like, you know, why am I not getting better conversion? Why am I not getting better first purchase? What's going on? My, where is it leaking? It's the, the word we ask ourselves. But sometimes that's not the right question to ask because you can solve a problem at one point of the funnel that creates problems in other points of the funnel. So you have to sort of always ask yourselves, how are all these things working together? So for us, it's always it's trying to understand it as one big, you know, one big set of interconnected aspects, customer experience, metrics, you know, cre creative, and how much we understand data and, and, and making it work. And one thing that we've looked at, um, one metric that we more and more look at actually is a metric of yield. Um, which is something that marketers historically have not always looked at, but I think more and more we look at that because we are used to look at LTV, looking at CAC, looking at conversion. But if you start thinking about that, what you're really solving for, you're really solving for, you know, if how is how are you, you know, what are you spending and what are you getting in real time and over time. So yield and you know and revenue management is becoming a bigger, bigger part of what marketers are doing in today's world. So Ash, with the concept of, of yield and, you know, uh, the whole idea of, uh, you know, the returns and the conversions that we talk about, it's a lot of customer data coming in. Now, with so much of, of data coming in, uh, what are some innovative ways uh, that, you know, you can actually uh, you know, uh, see these patterns coming up, you can improve your marketing efforts and, you know, yeah. you can overall create a better customer experience. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, right? Because data, it's, it's, it's almost like, this sounds strange, but like, Data helps you understand what that, which data matters. So, uh, because we are getting much, much better at trying at being able to predict behavior through all the things that we're doing with AI and machine learning, we are getting better and better at understanding what consumers are actually going to do, which then helps us understand what data matters. For example, um, we're you know we're, you, you'll, you'll understand more about churn and loyalty, um, and and if and if you try to solve, and should you be solving for those or not? Um, we, historically, we've always looked. You know, people look at LTV and CAC, but data will, stop, will tell you, for example, that you know consumers are becoming less and less loyal, and there's a you know, they're a lot more transient. And it, it, and it, I think if you look at the data the right way, you have to be able to know when to let go of certain data and not just cling to certain metrics that might not be relevant because that's what we've always thought they were. So maybe LTV is less important, and and something and and yield is more important, as an example. And so I, I think that the way I try to have my organization use data is to actually help us understand what metrics we should actually be looking at and, and being able to let go of you know, traditional sort of ways of thinking about certain metrics and really understand what drives business value. And so, and, and, if, and I think one of the things that marketers are, you know, this is what's challenging about this is that uh, there's, there's so many, what I call like micro contexts in terms of every funnel works a little differently. Every category works a little differently. For example, you know, tag, we, we're in multiple different healthcare categories. I can tell you right now, you know, even though we look at the funnel the same way and it looks the same, the, the metrics that we use to, to try to you know, unlock customer value is very different. And so for some areas, LTV matters. For some reason, it's at the transaction level. In other areas, it's all about demand. In other parts of the funnel, it's all about actually conversion. I mean, so like it really, you have to really understand and be very agnostic as you approach this to know what, what am I really solving for? And, and, you know, and then, and really then sort of have the data sort of tell the story, like strategy drives your data structure, not the other way around. Right. 
thank you so much ash uh, we actually have uh, comments coming in and you know questions coming in uh, so i would just uh, want to you know share one more question from my side and then uh, we can go into the comments and the questions being shared so is that okay that's fine yeah all right so all of you listening in those who've joined in a little bit late we are in conversation with ash and we're talking about all things marketing so please share your questions in the comments we'll come to it in just a minute so ash uh, you know you talked about the the new ways in which marketing is being done and uh, this is something we're all going through right now as an industry generative ai uh, chat gpt and other tools open ai tools uh, how has it changed your perspective your strategy for marketing uh, as as a cmo uh, yeah. how how have you thought of working with the technology yeah that's that seems to be the hot question right uh, and I, I think the first thing is everybody should probably just take a deep breath right and uh and not just panic to sort of figure out how to use this uh and feel like you have to figure out this strategy right away uh it's it's really early to sort of tell what's going to happen here and I, I like i've talked to my team and said first of all you know let's be responsible about how we think about what we're doing here uh take a little time to understand you know what are we trying to solve for like what is really uh, at risk not at risk where where are things going to move fast in this career where are they not um, and so we, we, we took a step back to try to understand, put a little team together to understand how to really think about this. Uh, there's, and then what are the obvious or low hanging things? Are there, are there you know, opportunities in SEO, opportunities in social media, are there opportunities in comms and things like that, where you are just basically, you're finding efficiencies and you're able to sort of create um, value very quickly um, versus the areas where we have to sort of really take a step back and understand um, you know, what the implications are um, of, of using this um, for, you know, much more, you know, I, I would say impact, you know, consumer impacting things or uh, ways in which, you know, again, you can use it irresponsibly um, when you sort of let something out, we, out into the wild where you actually don't know exactly what's going to happen. So uh, I think I think it's worth every, you know, all the companies taking a step back, maybe putting a little team together um, to sort of assess for the organization what the implications are. Get some facts around what's real and not real. You know, it's interesting when you know when we when we did this in my organization and, we, and our head of innovation, you know, came back and said, you know, this is not. There's there's a lot of this that's been going on for a long time. There's a couple of you know things that happened in terms of uh, recently that make people think there's been a you know a much bigger sort of curve than there really is. And so, how much of this is real versus how much of this has been created? Uh, so I think for me, just take a step back, understand, get facts come to your organization with a clear sort of strategy in terms of how you want to how you want to use this technology within your organization all right thank you so much for that ash and uh, with that we'll get started with the questions that are coming up in the chat so uh, the very first question that we have is uh, uh, in your opinion what are some of the biggest challenges your team faces regarding data governance and quality and how do you address that yeah i mean i mean that's my biggest challenge is that organizations are becoming more and more data rich and maybe less and less and more and more insight poor. Um, and the way you, you get there is sort of feeling like you're, you're overwhelmed with the amount of sort of data that's coming in and the need to sort of make sense or create, create value from it. And you have a lot of people in the organization spinning, trying to tap into the data, try to figure out how they're driving different parts of their organization. And so I think uh, as an organization, you have to understand your, what your data strategy is, and that should be driven by you know your purpose, your strategy in terms of what are you trying to solve for. And so I think you have again, similar to what I just said about um, the AI, like you have to take a step back and just really ask yourself, what am I trying to solve, and what am I really trying to do? So you can so you can really think about how how you want to use your data, and uh, because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna really struggle, um, in my view. Um, burdening the product organizations, the tech organizations, your analytic organizations, spinning and spinning and spinning, trying to create sort of data insights. And the question is, how much of it's really actionable? So I really push my organizations really hard to say, if you're going to ask for this and you just need help me understand up front, help me to clearly understand, like, what are you going to do with it? How do you think it's going to add value? Um, and is that value worth some of the efforts that we might have to do in order to, to sort of go get that? And so. Uh, you know, so that is valuable only in terms of how you're using it to drive certain things. And I think so spending time up front to understand that. And on the governance side, you have to make some decisions as an organization around sort of like, is this centralized, decentralized? How are you going to think about 
your DAS strategy or governance for your organization, where's that going to sit? Who's going to manage it? Where's their accountability? How are you going to respect the privacy laws? So like, it's just, it's, it's, this is a, in my view, sort of an ELT, a, a senior level decision in terms of how you're going to think about that and governance in the organization. And you create a structure, you create an organization around it, completely dedicated to just that. Okay, uh, so I hope that, you know, uh, the person who's asked the question, I can't see their name right now, but I hope it's answered your question. I love the next question, uh, Ash, that's from Akshay. And this is a dilemma that even I have faced as a marketer. He asks, how do you balance the need for data-driven decision-making with the need for creativity and intuition in marketing? Yeah, just ignore the data-driven part. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's the easiest way to do it. Um, Look, this is the this is the the, the, the tough question uh, that we um, it it it, it's, it does seem like it's harder and harder in this day's world as a marketer to you know trust your gut and creativity because it's so easy it's so easy to test everything it's so easy to create quick prototypes and put it out there and just get these answers right I mean it, it's it's harder and harder for people to justify clinging to sort of this intuition and you know creative insights and so on um and so the uh and so, so this is a tough one i think i think the reality is here it's it's hard to i think you you can allow the creativity intuition piece to really you know emerge but then there's ways to sort of test it uh and so i wouldn't i think the mistake in this question or the question is, is to think these things as, as opposed um, or working against each other. And I got caught, I've gotten caught in this trap too. Um, I, and I think the balance you have to find is there is a room. And my, my belief is there is a strong, it's still lots of room uh, to be high, for highly, you know, highly create the creativity and marketing and building great brands. But there's a way to do it right now um, that can be that, you know, data influence. It can be, you know, influenced by data and it can and, it, and you can test things very quickly and so i just don't think i think these things work together um and so uh, just recognize that and don't feel like you have to make go, go to one lane or the other i love that phrase influenced by data I, I think that that's something that all marketers should be looking at um the next question ash is uh, from deepak and he goes a little bit uh, you know into branding a yeah. larger uh, question that how can one create a consistent and cohesive brand message across all marketing channels? And he talks about like everything from social media to email marketing. Yeah, it's funny. So I have a couple of thoughts here. So one of them is a little counterintuitive and it goes against a lot of, I think, traditional uh, views on, on marketing. And that is around this of the customer. I think there's a lot of focus on the customer journey. Uh, everybody talks about that, trying to understand that the word is used a lot. It's actually uh, used as um, an organizing mechanism for a lot of organizations in terms of how they think about um, uh, structuring their, uh, their their work around the customer journey, understanding that your, your UX influences sort of the UX and the product organization and how you think about product innovation. From a marketing perspective, I think the one thing we have to realize now is that like consumers have m multiple ways into you, to your service practice services. They don't, we don't, it's hard to control where they sort of come in, where their entry point is. So I actually would argue that one of the thing, ways you have to do this is you have to not maybe let go a little bit of the thinking around like this is about awareness, this is about consideration, this is about like and so when they, and so when you create sort of things, you you sort of break it up in this way, and then you sort of create creative around that. You have this journey. I would argue that consumers can come in at any point. So the reality is your messages might need to be a lot more uniform and look alike, much more than they historically have. I, I think we, we live in a world right now where consumers need to understand what you're about like that, like in an instant, they don't have time to sit there and go on this huge journey with you in terms of like, you know, like, let me, let me nurture you in and bring you in. They need to know what you're about, what your value proposition is like that. And if you look at some of the great brands and what's out there these days, um, it's like, you can almost say what they are in, in, in a quick sentence and understand the value prop and almost everywhere you go, it's 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 there not just the 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 fluffy brand stuff but the offering the you know what we are what we're about how you do it it's sort of there and um and that's just the new world we live in you know you live in a world where you could come into us through an influencer through social media through whatever the ad through digital through this through tech the tv like there's a gazillion ways consumers can come at you if they hear about you uh, and so we don't really control that journey as much as we think we do so i think one of the ways to have a consistent message is exactly that have a consistent message 
that's what I said. Like, <laughs> make it consistent everywhere. Make it simple. Make it understandable. Make it action oriented, um, and and make it pass the blink test pretty quickly. Because if you have to over explain things to your consumers, you're probably not. You're probably going to lose them in today's world. Absolutely agree with that, Ash. The blink test is, is something uh, that you know is is going to be uh, you know something we follow. But also, I just wanted to add one line. This this sort of reminded me of a podcast where I heard that uh, you know consumers today they uh, consume content everything everywhere all at once, just like the Oscar movie. So you yeah. don't know how they are, you know which uh, channel you know they are uh, right now, which uh, you know stage of the funnel. So actually, they could be anywhere, and they can be looking at your content from anywhere. So yeah. thank you for that answer, Ash. Deepak, I hope that answers your question. Uh, moving on to the next question, Arjun uh, asks, how do you see the cookie-less world impacting the marketing function? Wow. Um, <laughs> you want me to solve for world hunger while I'm at it here? Um, <laughs> uh, um, I think it's going to make things a lot. I think it's going to make things harder. I, look, look I, um, it is going to test uh marketers ability to be sort of creative and thoughtful about how they gain insights into the consumers i think it's i i look our company's thinking about this right now um uh i think it's going to put pressure um on us to maybe more do more push versus pull marketing i actually think it's going to bring back a lot of traditional media a little bit more it's going to put like i think the consumers are going to going to realize that you're, you're going to have to sort of be thoughtful much more about um, about how you hit consumers because it's going to just make it challenging to use some of our traditional um, aspects, some of our retargeting, some of the more highly efficient channels that counted on knowing intent um, are going to be challenged for us. And so marketers are going to have to start getting good at some of the, I don't want to say old, some of the more traditional um, types of marketing, believe it or not, I think they're going to make a little bit of a comeback. Um, I think experiential things are going to be important. I think influencers, all that stuff, like all those things now. Um, uh, so your cookie now starts becoming your influencer. Like, like it's, it's almost like you're going to, you know, you're going to have to start thinking about different ways in to be able to find that signal, you know, that marker, because those things are markers for your consumers. So you're going to have to try to figure out how else am I going to not find markers? What, what other means am I going to be able to figure out intent? And so. I don't have the answers to all that, but I do know that every marketer is sort of thinking about this right now, not just not just because of the cookie-less world, because all the privacy laws that are sort of coming into play. Uh, consumers very empowered to basically go dark, like be visible. They can be cloaked fully. So, like, how do you find the cloaked, uh, you know, customer on the internet? You got to find them someplace else. So, I think I think we're heading towards a very interesting new age of sort of how marketers go out and find their customers in this in this sort of surge of privacy concerns in the world. Thank you for that, Ash. I, the next question is from Pavitra, and uh, she asks about uh, uh, small businesses or startups. So, any advice, Ash, that you have for yeah. them who generally operate with limited marketing budgets? Yeah, I think this is the. I think it's never been. I think it's never been better for for um, for small startups because uh, a just what I'm talking about now in terms of um, you know uh, you know the little bit of a. a level playing field a little bit but a couple things here first of all a lot of the search guys google these guys the the push there, there's a bit of real strong push to rewarding highly hyper lo highly localized um or companies uh and so i think there's in a lot of ways things are set up for if again if you're a small business um I, if you have a local footprint whatever i think that's really helpful if you're a small business trying to hit a national scale it's a little different but like from a from a local opportunities more and more and more people like Google are really rewarding that. Um, I also think like another thing that's cutting in your favor, and this is no this is no longer new news anymore, but you know, all the social platforms are just that is another leveling of the playing field, right? And you can tap in, particularly if you can find somebody who's passionate about what you're doing in your brand, and finding influencers that are passionate about what you're doing, uh, I think that can be transformative for 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 a brand. Um, and so you know, obviously social media, obviously being really great at SEO, being great at local, all these things actually can make it, can, can really help. And it, you don't need big budgets. You just need to be thoughtful about how you're sort of doing. It. I think that what you shouldn't try to do is probably just think about sort of like, how can I make, you know, how can I go into these traditional channels and, and, and make my spend the most efficient possible? Because I think you're going to have a lot of ways of you can, if you're not careful, you'll sort of suboptimize yourself into some really poor results. I think, I think you have to really be thinking about like new ways of coming in that I can maximize the aperture versus 
how do I, you know, how do I, what can I do? What, how can I do most with the least spend in these biggest channels? I've just found so many companies struggle because they really can't hit that threshold of spend. Uh, I think direct response is also making another big comeback as well. So I think there's opportunities with a direct response that should be, like, small companies should be looking at. They can get really affordable, targeted. So I think I think things like that, like think think small with a big voice versus small with a little voice as you think about the channels you're going into. Think small with a big voice. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question, Pavitra, and hope this answers. Uh, Ash, there are some comments coming in that these are great insights, so it's it's really helpful, uh, the whole session. Thank you again for that. Uh, just taking a minute here, anyone who has any more questions for Ash, we are going to take uh, you know one or two last questions and you know we, we will wrap up the session. So please share in the comments. Uh, meanwhile, we have our next question from Yashasvi. Uh, Yashasvi says, uh, hi Ash, what emerging trends do you see shaping the future of marketing and customer experience? Well, so I've touched on a couple of them, um, but I, I'll, I'm going to say a couple more. I actually think this is going to sound strange, but I think sort of building great brands is making a little bit of a comeback. I think, the, you know, I think we swung towards this interesting and this is not going away. I'm just saying we've sw we swung towards this place that like the era of just being able to create these great customer experiences and value propositions and, and, and things weren't built a lot through just like great branding and advertising. It was built through disruptive technology, disruptive value propositions, you know, the Ubers of the world, the DoorDash, they, they built these, solve these big problems uh, for us. I think, I think, I think now is areas are getting more crowded as barriers to entry start crumbling and things are getting easier, easier to do. I actually think there's a little bit of swing back to like building really kind of brands that people like. And so uh, that's just me. I, th I think brand loyalty sort of was on a shaky ground for a while. I think it's starting to come back a little bit, but I think the way it's going to reemerge is, is not about, you know, you putting out sexy advertising. I think it's going to be about, again, and people know this, but people wanting to associate your brand and your brands in their unique way that they want to associate with them. So, you know, how do brands sort of become something you know, to stand for something, but not necessarily stand for something like we're about like finding a cause, but just find something that you stand for the consumers actually relate to or want to relate to or want to be a part of. And I think the, so I think brands are coming back in a, in a different way. I also think, simple, like, like I'm saying, I'm going to repeat it again, simple value propositions, like the idea of like just being able to be simple and sharp and understand very specifically, you know, what you're trying to do and, and, and why consumers should care and what problem are they solving in a very, very specific way. I think is is um, is going to be more and more important, um, and so I, I think you know, as you think about um, uh, you know the trends. You know, I talked about the thinking about the funnel um, with all this AI sort of coming. I think there's going to be a whole new wave of like, how do you bring humanness to this world? Like I think that's going to be an entire industry that emerges, uh, can because that because we are it, it is kind of scary, and it is and I think. As we as this technology gets, you know, it gets more and more and more like humans. The reality is, you know, humanness can sort of disappear in a way, in a strange way. And I think there's going to be a lot of people trying to figure out what to do with this and bring empathy and emotion stuff back, and uh, and actually helping people sort through it. And I think brands that can sort of actually navigate that are actually going to have a big advantage going forward. Uh, on, on the same note, I think uh, Rushali has one more question and Ash, I think it's almost time. So we'll, we'll just take one more question. Okay. Uh, if that's okay with you. Yes, one more. That's fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah right. So uh, Rushali asks uh, for some examples of uh, possibly how you or your team have used analytics to better understand customer behavior and preferences and how this is linked to marketing strategies. So this is something that we could all learn from. Yeah, I think for me, this 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 goes back a little bit to uh, the, the, the funnel discussion. Um, you know, we have spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand, like, because we are um, getting better at, at sort of understanding long-term, um, you know, predictors of the, uh, like, let me take a, take a step back. Um, because we're getting better and better at tying certain customer, segments, profiles, personas, as we like to call them, um, and, and being able to better and better and better predict accurately how they're gonna behave through your funnel. Um, it's, it's made us think very differently about who we go after, how we spend that money, who's really valuable, not valuable. 
um, not just valuable to us as a customer, but what, what we have is valuable to them as a customer in terms of like with that map. So being able to sort of understand that more and more and then ask the question of why, um, like they're coming in the funnel, but they're not actually converting. Okay, well, we can, without giving way too much away, we, not, we now better than ever understand why they're not, right? And, and, and candidly, that's just come over time and getting more, more and more data and, and being able to sort of get better predictive analytics, understanding markers, doing a lot of research to, to look, look at all, do all the regression stuff to understand that. So based on understanding that now, we know now we know better how to go out and sort of find the customers that built this. So basically just getting better and better understanding, you know, which customer will behave in what way within your funnel and then why just helps you get better and better at sort of understanding what customers you want to attract into your funnel. The other thing we've done to say is that we also are starting to understand more and more what, what metrics matter and don't matter. Like, um, you know, does LTV really matter in, you know, in this category? And again, in some, some rubber categories, it matters a lot. In others, it doesn't. But I can't tell you how many times I've like new marketers have come in and they're just, what's the LTV? What's the CAC to LTV ratio? Like, it's just like, the questions I'm usually always asking, CAC to LTV, this and that and that. And it's like, that's not the right question to ask. So like being, having your data tell you what are the right questions to ask is the best way to sort of use data, um, not make the data bend to your will of the questions you're already asking and you want your data to sort of explain to you how you optimize, minimize CAC and increase LTV. You're, you're sort of answering the question backwards. And so that for me, that's sort of been you know how my how how we've sort of started with the customer behavior and had it take us to the data rather than the other way around okay thank you so much for that ash i think we're almost at time i uh, want to wrap up with one very favorite question i know you're a podcaster and i want to know what are some podcasts that you are listening to right now what podcast listen to right now uh, well, my guilty pre pleasure is uh, a, a podcast called The Rewatchables, which is about like it's about like old mo movies. Um, but I like I like a, a one called How They Built This, which is a, pod a great podcast because it tells stories about how CEOs built great companies. And it's always great to hear. And this is to my point I'm talking about today. Like what's great about it is that everybody came out of solving a different problem with a different insight, And it just tells you like, the, the people, these, these great CEOs or great leaders who have built great companies have done it because they were hyper focused on understanding exactly what problem they were trying to solve with their customer and then building something that was very, you know, very focused on that. And they built their entire organization and their cultures, everything about started at that. So like, it's very inspiring. And it reminds you that there's so many great ways um, to, to you know build great companies. Uh, and it reminds you all the time that like, don't ever forget who your customer is. Focus on that. Focus on the problem you're solving. Um, and as soon as you veer away from that, you're, you know, you're in trouble. So I love, it's a great podcast everybody should listen to. Thank you so much. That's on my list. All right. So uh, with that, Ash, thank you so much for making time uh, for us today. Uh, you know, we, we all learned so much. And uh, you listening, this is just the very first of these AMA sessions. We'll have much more. Uh, please go and listen to more of Ash's insights on his podcast, Hold Me Back. And uh, you can check out AIXC Leader Talks as well on Spotify. Give us a follow. And till next time, have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ash. Thank you.